Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Tracy Cook with SACS Healthcare Communications, and I'll be your webinar producer for today's event. Before I introduce our moderator, Kimberly Kelly, and our speaker, Nicole Kupchuk, I would like to show the audience how to send questions and comments. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You can also download a copy of today's presentation in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Our moderator today is Kimberly Kelly. Ms. Kelly is currently a clinical consultant for Cheetah Medicare and has been a critical care nurse for almost 15 years. She has been a very active member of the American Association of Critical Care Nurses and is currently a regional board member. In 2015, Ms. Kelly wrote a widely used self-learning module for use in her hospital facility on Code Blue. Welcome, Kimberly. Good afternoon and good morning. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is When Edison is the Medicine, Tips for Defibrillation, Cardioversion, and Pacing. Speaking today on this very timely topic is a colleague and friend of mine, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole has practiced as a critical care nurse for over 20 years. About 15 years ago, she began working at Harborview Medical Center, a change that spurred an interest in resuscitation. Shortly thereafter, Nicole was part of a multidisciplinary team that was one of the first in the United States to implement therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. As part of this effort, Nicole was responsible for protocol development and has published numerous papers on this topic. In 2013, Nicole founded Nicole Kupchik in Consulting and Education. She has the following disclosures with relationships with on the Speakers Bureau for Stryker and La Jolla Pharmaceuticals, as well as the consultant for Stryker and Baxter Healthcare. Continuing education for nurses, respiratory therapists, and EMS professionals. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. The link to obtain the CE credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar. The accreditation statements are as below. And support for this educational activity has been provided by Stryker. Nicole, are you ready to get started? I am, Kim. Thanks for that nice introduction. Good morning or afternoon to everybody out there. Um, hopefully this will be just kind of a fun webinar where we're going to do what's likely going to be a review for a lot of you with some kind of tips. And I named this when Edison's the medicine, <laughs> keys to defibrillation, cardioversion, and pacing. So let's have some fun and get started here. All right. Um, so our objectives for this session, I'm going to talk about the recent recommendations regarding um, uh, just uh, uh, um, pacing, defibrillation, and cardioversion. So let's start out with pacing, so emergent pacing. So we're going to launch a poll. So Tracy, are you ready to launch this poll? I am, thanks. Okay, so here's what I, the first question I have for you all. Um, have you ever had to emergently pace a patient? And this can be transvenous, transcutaneous, uh, maybe with a PA, uh, a pacing swan, um, epicardial. So we'd just love to know if you've ever had been in a situation where you've had to emergently pace. All right, so I'm assuming the votes are rolling in. We'll see what you guys say out there. All right, Tracy, you getting some votes? We are. Let's just give it a okay. few more seconds. All right, just want to know if you've had to emergently pace. And it's a scary thing, I'll tell you. Uh, you know, I can remember the very first time I ever had to um, transcutaneously pace a patient. And I was uh, pretty, I'll tell you, I was shaking in my boots for sure. All right. So votes are rolling in. Oh, so it's about 50-50, okay. Yeah, um, so about 54% of you have, 46% of you haven't. Okay, so we'll get back to the slides. 
where we will now um, kind of get into the first section, which is pacing. So, okay, here we go. All right, so this is the um, algorithm to American Heart Association for a bradycardia. And, um, and you all just know, pacing is not one of the first things we go to. Usually we'll try a little bit of atropine, so usually about 0.5 milligrams, see if that works. Um, the maximum on that is three milligrams. Some other things we could do is we could do epinephrine infusions. Um, dopamine, interestingly, I always jokingly <laughs> talk about dopamine and just say the 1990s call them, they want their dopamine back, right? You know, but because we don't use it as much as a vasopressor anymore. However, um, one of the things that's nice about dopamine, as you all know, the reason we don't use it as much anymore is because it causes tachycardias. So in a symptomatic bradycardia, it actually is a treatment you can um, try on a patient. Um, but um, atropine, I think, is one of those things most of us are comfortable with. So if a patient doesn't respond, then we can go to emergent pacing. Um, so a couple things. Um, so the first thing we're talking about is transcutaneous pacing. Um, this is, uh, again, non-invasive pacing um, where we use electrodes or defibrillator pads on the skin and we'll deliver energy through those electrodes and pads. Um, and, and as you can imagine, if we're pacing externally through skin, you've got to get through skin, bone, muscle, adipose. And so it takes a heck of a lot more energy than if you had a wire either inside of the heart or sewn on top of the heart with transvenous or um, epicardial pacing. Um, most patients, I will tell you, I've had to pace um, transcutaneously. I, I've worked for the most part of my career in big STEMI centers. And um, I would tell you just from experience, most patients require a minimum of filling uh, 50 milliamps of energy to get capture. Um, I've had patients where, like, I, especially like COPDers, I find need more energy. Um, patients who are or who are pretty obese will need more energy um, to get capture to successfully pace them. So a couple things I can't say enough about pacing prep for the um, the pads. Um, I know one of the things we'll jokingly say, if you've got an emergently pace, you just got to do it quick. And right, so one of the things we can do is what I jokingly call a $100 wax job, right? Where you'll take a set of, if you've got somebody who's got a hairy chest, you can take one set of patches, put them on, and then quickly rip them off to get, um, to remove a lot of hair in a quick situation. Um, but if you've got time, you know, clip excessive hair, you want to get as good of contact with the skin with those uh, pacing pads as possible. Um, ideally, like if you could properly prep uh, the skin, you would clip the hair, clean the skin, uh, wipe with alcohol, let it completely dry, and then put the electrodes on. But we all know then there's reality where you don't, uh, in a lot of these situations, you don't have time to do that. Um, anterior, for pacing, anterior posterior placement is preferred. There is some evidence that, um, that there's better capture and less energy use when you do anterior posterior placement of your defibrillator pads which now are going to serve as pacing electrodes and then the other thing i can't like stress enough is you have to have the ecg electrodes from whatever defibrillator you're using placed on the patient uh, to successfully pace a patient this is the only function on most defibrillators where you absolutely have to have the ecg electrodes and then just an, another thing is make sure like if the patient if you see maybe an incision in the upper left hand chest um, indicating that there's a permanent pacemaker just make sure you're at least an inch to two inches away from an underlying pacemaker when you place the pads never place the pads directly over a pacemaker um, and then um, other things just make sure if you've got somebody who needs pacing that um, if they're if they're needing 12 hours of pacing or more, that you change your pads. But let's just be honest, I'm not doing that if they need to, if they're dependent on pacing for life. So, um, but I mean, in general, if you've got somebody or transcutaneous pacing, you should be very quickly getting ready to place a transvenous pacer. Um, this is meant to be a super, super, super short-term uh, therapy for a, a patient um, if they truly are pacing uh, dependent in that situation. So, so again, just um, pad placement, anterior, posterior, just one more time to, um, to really uh, stress is the preferred placement. You can do anterior lateral um, in, uh, with pacing, but anterior, posterior, 
here is preferred. And most of your heart lies toward the left. So the way you want to think about any time you're pacing pa uh, ECG, I'm sorry, not ECG, but uh, defibrillator pads or uh, these pacing electrodes is you want to sandwich a heart. So you want the heart like in between those, those patches. Um, and always think about it that way. So kind of know anatomically kind of the direction the heart should lie and think about putting those uh, patches as like bread in a sandwich um, around, uh, around the heart. So um, patient prep, uh, you know, a lot of times when you've got somebody who is bradycardic and very symptomatic with it, they might have decreased LOC or level of consciousness. But once you start pacing, they're, they're probably going to wake up a bit more. Um, another thing you'll see is that when you pace, much, the muscles may twitch under those um, pacing electrodes. That's not uncommon. And then just, you know, I think just be prepared that you might have to give um, sedation and or analgesia. Um, um, especially once the patient starts to wake up. So, you know, instructing the family and patient as much as possible. This is a super scary thing for patients, um, you know, as you can imagine. Okay, here's our next polling question. So Tracy's gonna launch the poll. And the question is, when is it appropriate to use asynchronous mode, to use an asynchronous mode to pace? So when is it appropriate? So when it is a, when is it appropriate? And then I'm gonna just make some, like a lot of comments about asynchronously or non-demand pacing. I have some super strong feelings on this. So all right, so Tracy's launched the poll. So get your votes in. So when would it appropriately? And so basically, some some of you out there might be like, what does she mean by asynchronous pay, uh, mode to pace? So basically, what this means is that the pacer is going to pace no matter what. So no matter what that patient's underlying rhythm is, it's going to pace no matter what. When would that be appropriate? All right, Tracy, do we have votes coming in? We do, but let's just give it a few more seconds for everyone to vote. Thanks. All right, we'll see what everyone has to say on this one. <laughs> All right, when is it appropriate to use the asynchronous mode for pacing? And um, so the answer is asystole. So, so here's what I want you to say. Okay, so C is the answer, asystole. All right, so when... I, so basically asynchronous mode is a pacing mode that you really shouldn't be using. Um, the only time it would be appropriate is if the patient's asystolic. So whenever you've got a pacemaker that's pacing, you want it to sense or see what the patient is doing as an underlying rhythm. And if the patient has their own intrinsic beat, you want the pacemaker to inhibit and not pace when the patient has their own intrinsic beat. So the proper um, answer for this is asystole. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, let's go, we'll get back to our slides. So different modes of pacing. So synchronous and demand pacing is the safest. That is the mode you should be using. And when you turn on your um, defibrillator, um, it should default to synchronous or demand pacing. And so what happens basically is pa pa the pacemaker will only, or the defibrillator will only only pace when pacing is needed. So if the patient has an uh, intrinsic activity, it will sense that and it will inhibit pacing uh, when that is the case. Um, and this is why you need the ECG um, electrodes from your defibrillator. So your defib patches turn into the pacemaker delivery mode. Um, so that the patches are going to deliver the energy, whereas your underlying or your ECG is going to um, sense any un underlying uh, intrinsic ECG activity. Um, so asynchronous or fixed mode means that it's going to pace no matter what. And this can be really dangerous, especially if a, a pacing stimulus is delivered during the T wave, which represents repolarization of the heart. It can lead to ventricular fibrillation. So, so this is a super, super important thing to understand. You should be pacing in synchronous or demand pacing, even in asystole, because even in asystole, if it doesn't see any intrinsic activity, it's still going to pace. So, um, so that's um, just a really important point. Point I want to make because I find sometimes people will get really creative with um, with their uh, their equipment. Okay, so here's a patient that's in. You can see a kind of a junctional rhythm. It they're very bradycardic. 
blood pressure 72 over uh, 42 with a MAP of 50. They're breathing about 26 a minute. The patient's pale and diaphoretic. You've tried a couple doses of atropine, so 0.5 milligrams of atropine's been attempted. Um, heart rate goes up to the 80, but it, 80s, but it quickly drops, and the patient's uh, LOC is decreased. So what do you want to do here? And the answer is, well, if we've tried atropine, it's not really doing the trick, then we need to pace this patient. So, um, so we're going to get this patient paced. Um, so again, reminder, the ECG electrodes need to be on this patient. So you can see here, what I'm going to do is hit the pacer button. And I'm using the LifePak 20 here, but this, this it's the same for um, just about any defibrillator. Um, you want to um, start the pacing function. You're going to select the rate and then the output. So output is just energy. That's all output is. Output is just how much milliamperage are you going to use to pace the patient. You can see here, I've got a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS. I'm using my pointer here to point that out. So you'll see a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS. The QRS will always be wide. Why? Well, because you're stimulating um, one side of the ventricle. So one, side, one ventricle is gonna start depolarization and then it's gonna wave across to the other ventricle. So the QRS will always be wide. So I'll go ahead and play this video one more time so you can just kind of see what I did. So if you're emergently pacing, you're gonna hit the pacer function on your defibrillator, increase the rate, set a rate, and I'll talk about how you decide where to set the rate. And then you're gonna increase the output or milliamps until you see a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS. So here we're not paced, there we're paced. So you can see you've got a pacing spike with a wide QRS immediately following. And that's key of what you'll see um, when you've got successful pacing, um, electrical capture. So that's just electrical capture. Now you've got to check a pulse and make sure that you have mechanical capture um, and that it's actually going through. So how do you decide where to set the heart rate, right? And it's, it's really simple. So cardiac output equals what times what? And it's heart rate times stroke volume. So stroke volume is just the amount of blood you're ejecting with each heartbeat. And I can assume if my patient's hypotensive that the stroke volume is low. So what can we manipulate here? I can manipulate heart rate. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, there's no magic to this. So if you've got a patient who's symptomatic, pressure's in the toilet, um, then set the heart rate higher. If you've got a patient who's just kind of borderline, then I don't know, maybe set the heart rate at, at 60. Um, if they're super hypotensive, set it at 80. There's no magic to this. You basically just set the heart rate or the rate of the pacer, see how the patient responds, and then adjust as needed. So, so the whole idea is by stimulating the heart rate, we want to increase the stroke volume when we're emergently pacing. Okay, so now, again, we're just going to show capture here. So this is just demonstrating I've got a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS. Now here, the electrodes came off, the ECG electrodes came off. So anytime your ECG electrodes come off, you will not be able to pace. And so it is essential that you have those ECG electrodes placed on the patient. So when you see this pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS, that's electrical capture. Now what you want to do is palpate the pulse to see if you have mechanical capture. The pulse rate should be the same as the heart rate that's set on your, um, your uh, defibrillator. So here I've got the heart rate set at 70 beats per minute. The milliamperage is set at 70 milliamps. That's actually pretty common um, in a pace patient you have to emergently pace. So again, just palpate the pulse to make sure that you've got a um, mechanical capture as well as electrical capture. So that's where the electrodes came off. So you're not gonna be able to pace. It will not pace during that segment. So you have got to make sure those um, ECG electrodes are really secure on that patient. So clinically, you'll have a set of ECG electrodes from your bedside monitor, and then you'll have a second set of ECG electrodes from the defibrillator that you're using. So this is just demonstrating, basically, I've got a pacing stimulus. So you see the pacing spike 
immediately followed by a wide QRS. If your QRS is narrow, that's you're not that's not capture. Um, so with specifically with transcutaneous pacing, you'll see a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS. Now I'll just warn you, like if you're doing transvenous pacing, you may not see a pacing spike. Um, so now all the for transvenous pacing, we're using bipolar leads, and um, the the basically the signal that's coming from the generator, um, what's being ses um, sensed from the catheter and um, communicated with the generator is so that that communication time is so fast that you don't see a pacing spike. Um, you just have to look for a wide QRS. Anytime your ventricular pacing, you will always see a wide QRS. So again, pacing spike followed by a wide QRS. Pacing, pacing spike, wide QRS. That's electrical capture. Now you need to assess for mechanical capture. And just a reminder, your pulse rate should be um, the same as the rate on the pacemaker. So do we have mechanical capture here? Um, I don't know. You know, we have to check a patient's pulse. So, okay. Um, now this is a problem. So, um, so basically here you could see I've got a pacing spike, but there's no wide QRS immediately following. Basically, what's happening here is just the patient's underlying um, intrinsic rhythm. So this is failure to capture. So I should have seen a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS, but I don't see that there. So if that's the case, then you need to increase the energy. Make sure that you've got um, the pacing patches are you've got good contact you might have to replace those pads um, check labs if they're hypokalemic hypomagnesemic or hyper um, kalemic hyper magnesemic they may not capture as well now with this one this one's dangerous this is super dangerous so this is failure to sense so basically I've got a pacing spike on the T wave and luckily this is in the early part of the T wave so that's the absolute refractory period you're likely not going to stimulate RNT, but if this pacing spike were in the um, relative refractory period, you could actually stimulate RNT and um, cause the patient to go into V-fib. So um, I would ask a couple questions. Are we in fixed mode, meaning um, that the pacer is going to pace no matter what? Or, um, you know, so check the mode. You should be in demand mode or synchronous pacing. Uh, look at your pads. Uh, make sure your pads have good placement. Make sure your ECGs have good placement. But this can be super dangerous when you have failure to sense. But basically, you've got a pacing spike where it shouldn't be. So you can see you've got a pace a pacemaker that's just delivering a stimulus, and it's not seeing that patient's underlying um, intrinsic rhythm. You should have never seen a pacing spike there. So basically, the pacing um, interval should have been reset uh, at this R wave. Okay, so that's failure to sense. And then this is failure to pace. This is just scary. So this is what happens when your ECG electrodes come off, is um, you can't pace during that uh, time. So check your ECD, ECG electrodes, check your pad placement, um, assess your connections, get a new device if you need to. But you can see if this obviously were to go on for too long, you'd have to start CPR, which would be a really bad thing uh, in this patient. So this is failure to Pace. Okay, that was pacing in a nutshell. So think about your questions. If you have any questions on pacing, um, I'm going to take questions at the end of this webinar, and um, and I'll try to answer um, any questions you might have on pacing. Okay, so now we're going to talk about other ways we use Edison as the medicine. So let's talk about cardioversion. Um, so I'll just tell you, I've been an ACLS instructor since 1998. Some of you may not even have been a nurse by then, but I've been, that's how long I've been instructing. And I always got stuck with the tachyarrhythmia station because it's, a, I'll tell you as an instructor, it's one of those stations that's really um, challenging to, uh, to teach. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to launch a poll. So Tracy's going to launch a poll. And what we want to know is, have you ever had to cardiovert a patient in rapid rhythm? So that's what I'm wanting to know. Have you ever had to personally cardiovert a patient? Because this can be super, super, super scary. This can be really, really scary for um, for the patient especially, uh, but for all the staff involved as well. So it's just a yes or no. Have you ever had to do this? So hopefully the votes are rolling in. They are, Nicole. Let's just give it a few more seconds. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, this is super scary. 
All right. Oh, so yes, yeah, so a little more of you have had the cardiovert versus pace. And I'm not surprised by this. Yeah, I'm not totally not surprised. So 58% of you are saying yes, I've had the cardiovert, whereas 42 of you are, percent of you are saying no. Okay, so let's um, go to the next slide here, and we will continue and chat about uh, cardioversion. So this is the um, HA adult tachycardia with a pulse algorithm, and as you can see, it is super busy. It's um, there's lots of different options for meds. You want to know are you stable unstable is the QRS narrow is it wide um, so there's lots of different um, different things we can do here so I am going to focus mostly on um, cardioverting and SVT um, so a couple things uh, so I'm going to place so this is a um, an SVT and you can see very, very uh, rapid, uh, it's narrow, and it's regular. So those are all the questions we're asking. Is this stable or unstable? Um, if it's unstable, prepare, prepare for cardioversion. And I'll just, you know, I'm going to be honest. Okay, so there's what a book says, right? And then there's real life. Um, even in unstable um, patients, we might try some non-invasive attempts before actually moving to cardioversion. So first of all, let's just talk about just a couple things. Who does cardioversion work best for? And the answers are like a flutter. AV nodal Rantry tachycardia, so that can include like SVT, um, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation. Now, AFib is it's not our first go-to by any means, but but these are who cardioversion works best in. And what basically what you're doing is you're going to synchronize an electrical stimulus to the QRS complex. And that's why, so as you can see in the um, video I took here, is you have got to make sure that all of these R waves are marked. And it is really, really important because we're gonna synchronize and deliver the electrical stimulus um, to that QRS to depolarize all excitable tissue. Um, and what this does is this makes the tissue refractory um, in, um, in the circuits so that it can no longer propagate or sustain a reentry type arrhythmia. So when you've got rapid arrhythmias like this, like SVT and like um, AV nodal reentry tachycardias, a flutter, you've got reentry patterns. And so what you're trying to do is break that reentry pattern. So there's a couple really, um, a couple things we can do before we go straight to cardioversion. And I have a little acronym that's called VAD. So it's called VAD. So these are less invasive things we can do to get a person out of SVT. So we can do a vagal maneuver. And I'm just going to say, um, I'm just going to put this out there. I see a lot of nurses and I'll just say providers do vagal maneuvers that are super ineffective. They'll instruct patients in super ineffective ways. And um, one of the most effect ineffective things I'll hear somebody say is they'll say to the patient, bear down, pretend like you're taking a poo. And you know, that doesn't work. I, that just doesn't work. Um, what One of the things you can do that's super easy to vagal a patient is take a 10 cc syringe, plop the plunger out of it, and give the patient the, the end where you would put a needle, and tell the patient to put their mouth around it, um, but to forcefully blow through that syringe and try to forcefully blow for at least 10 seconds. That stimulates a vagal response way better than saying to the patient, bear down, you know. Um, if you've got a patient who's intubated, you can suction them. That will cause them to cough um, often unless they're paralyzed. Um, it'll cause them to cough and you can um, stimulate a vagal maneuver that way. Now, one of, um, there's actually new research on a uh, type of vagal that's called postural vagaling and what you do is you sit the patient straight up so imagine a patient sitting straight up um, so sitting up legs straight for 10 to 15 seconds you instruct them to like blow through a syringe forcefully and then after 10 to 15 seconds what you do is you rapidly drop the patient's head flat and lift up their legs and they've studied this it's called po a postural vagal maneuver They've studied that against just regular vagal maneuvers, and they've seen an increase of, of uh, conversion out of rapid um, SVT um, of over 30%. So it's a much, much more, um, just much more effective way to use a vagal maneuver.
Okay, so that's vagaling. So again, remember my acronym is VAD, V-A-D. The next thing is adenosine. So um, you could do six milligrams of rapid IV push adenosine. You have to give it rapidly. The half-life is only like about three to five seconds. So it's a super, super fast half-life. Um, and you can, if you could try six milligrams, if six doesn't work, you could try 12. If 12 doesn't work, you try another 12. And one of the things like I'll always ask, ask nurses is what's the max of adenosine? And they're like, six 6, 12, 12. Well, and the answer is actually, it, it, there is really no max of adenosine. If it doesn't work, if it hasn't worked in three doses, it's probably just not going to work. Um, so you can try adenosine. Um, you want to give it to whatever IV is closest to the heart. And if adenosine doesn't work, you can always try dil diltiazem. So dilt or cardizem is a calcium channel blocker. So that would be another option before going to cardioversion. Okay, so let's say we've tried all these things and really just nothing's working. So here's a 41 year old who's got um, endocarditis. They've got a very rapid, uh, narrow-ish complex uh, tachycardia. And um, and you're trying to get them out of this tachycardia because they're hypotensive. So you've tried vagaling, you've tried adenosine. So here's the adenosine we try. You try adenosine, and this actually broke the rhythm. And so one of the things I have to say when you're giving adenosine is make sure you instruct the patient that they're going to feel breathless. Adenosine in and of itself will make a patient feel breathless. And a lot of patients will say when they get adenosine that they feel like they got kicked in the chest by a horse and the wind got knocked, it out, or got knocked out of them. And that's a pretty common thing. Now, here's um, where adenosine was given and it didn't work. Um, so it, it worked just temporarily. The patient went back into the rhythm. But the nice thing about giving here is you really effectively saw that you're dealing with a flutter. And if the patient's unstable, a flutter is actually pretty responsive to cardioversion. So, um, so this would be a patient where I would try meds first if they were stable and then go to cardioversion. Okay, so let's say we've tried everything. It's not working. Now we've decided we're going to cardiovert this patient. So what do you need at the bedside? So I or at the bedside. So I've got a little acronym that's called Oh Say It Isn't So. These are all things you have to have at the bedside. So Oh Say It Isn't So. So what starts with an O that you'd have to have ready to cardiovert? And the answer is oxygen. What starts with an S? The answer is sedation. You need some sort of a sedative that has amnesic effect. Um, this can be absolutely traumatizing for patients. Um, patients do get PTSD after cardioversions. So you need to make sure you've got some sort of a sedative on board. Um, intubation and airway supplies. If it's a high-risk patient, um, anesthesia should be at the bedside. Um, you have to have an IV in place. And then the last S, so remember it's O, say it isn't so, is sink. That sink has got to be pressed. I will tell you if that sink is not pressed and you don't have that sink button on and you deliver a stimulus, if it gets delivered in the relative refractory period, that patient can go into ventricular fibrillation. This is not a little deal. This is a very huge deal. And I will tell you, I ran a code blue committee for a long time and we had a patient where, you know, the nurses were all trained to do, use the cardioverter, um, the defibrillator to cardioverter. And one of the residents wanted to, you know, she wanted to learn how to do it. And the first cardioversion that was done, that the sync button was depressed. The second cardioversion, the sync button did not get depressed, and the patient went to V-fib, and they had to get chest compressions for 20 minutes. So um, one of the things you can do, this is an FYI to a lot of people, is most defibrillators can be reprogrammed so that once you hit the sync button, if you have to sync again, it can stay on. Um, so you can work with your biomed team to, you know, to reprogram your defibrillator so that the sync button stays on. So, and that's what we end up doing as a safety mechanism is we uh, made, we reprogram the devices so that the sync button would stay on. Okay, so here's our case. You've got a 62 year old, um, uh, who's got SVT at a rate of 217, you can see. So pretty uh, fast rate there. So we've um, attempted vagal, didn't work. We had the patient blow through a syringe, didn't work. We tried adenosine, six milligrams, 
then 12 milligrams, no success. Now the blood pressure 68 over 42. The patient feels short of breath. Their level of consciousness is decreasing. Now what? Well, it's a talk on cardioversion, so guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna cardiovert. Okay, so um, so what now? We're gonna cardiovert. So a couple safety things. Make sure that sync button, you can see the sync button there is pressed. Now the R waves are all going to be marked. Um, you're going to set the energy. And so a lot of people will ask me, like, where do you set the energy? And I don't know, just some kind of basic um, basics to think about is like for A flutter, A flutter and SVT usually, um, or like an AV nodal reentry, usually you can get the patient out pretty easily with lower energy. So I don't know, you know, start like 50 to 100 joules. Um, a fib, I will tell you, is very difficult to get a patient out of. So for A fib, usually we start with higher energy doses. So you might start with like 200 joules um, or maybe even go higher with atrial fibrillation. Um, in general, we prefer anterior posterior pad placement for cardioversion for, um, for patients. Um, other safety things, you want to make sure the potassium is above four, the magnesium is above two. So you want to make sure your electrolytes um, are replenished. Um, if they're on warfarin, you want the patient therapeutic. So ideally, you'd want the patient um, at least, you know, an INR of two to three. Um, if they've been in, in um, especially AFib for more than 48 hours, it is indicated to anticoagulate them. If there's any question, you should do a transesophageal echo prior to cardioversion to, um, you know, just to make sure that they don't, patient doesn't have a blood clot. So again, this, it all depends. Are they stable, unstable? What um, rhythm are we dealing with here? Because obviously AFib is going to have the biggest risk for um, blood clot development. Um, so again, make sure that sync button is pressed, dial your energy, and then one of the things you have to make sure you do is keep that, uh, the, basically the energy deliver, delivery button pressed while you deliver the energy. Um, so, so you're gonna see here, so basically I'm setting the energy, I'm charging, and then you have to hold down that delivery button until the energy gets delivered. That's a really important concept to understand. If you just quickly press that red button, that energy delivery button, just quickly press it, and if it's not like at the R wave, it won't release the energy. And then the nurses, you know, I've heard nurses say, this defibrillator is not working. You know, it works. You have to hold down that red button until the device sees an R wave and delivers during the R wave. So um, after you cardiovert, you always want to, again, you know, just basics, look at your rhythm. Um, if the, they did not successfully cardiovert, then you should attempt another cardioversion. And then if they go into V-fib, you should be prepared immediately to go into an unsynchronized defibrillation for ventricular fibrillation. So again, that's, uh, we're talking cardioversion here. So, um, so AFib, is, is tough, right? It, it's complex. I mean, you could give a whole talk on just like AFib and, and um, how to treat AFib. In general, um, you know, we start getting worried at the bedside when they have a rapid ventricular rates of over, you know, 150, 160s, 170s, and they get unstable. So you always, for cardioversion, always want to know, is this new? Or is it chronic? Because if, it if it's chronic, you know, you risk uh, clot, um, development and embolization causing stroke. Um, I just put some meds here that we commonly use for um, rate control. They've studied in AFib rate control versus rhythm conversion, and they've been studied head to head, and one isn't superior over the other. So either you can rate control with like a beta blocker like metropolol, um, esmol, um, or a calcium channel blocker like DILT, um, verapamil would be another option. So either you can rate control or rhythm convert with like amiodarone um, or uh, like percanamide or different antiarrhythmics. So again, one's not superior over the other. But with, specifically with AFib, what we worry about is, you know, as humans, we all have this stupid little, I call it stupid because it causes problems as we get older, but this stupid little atrial appendage that, you know, if I'm in sinus rhythm, blood gets up into the appendage, our atria contract, the blood gets pushed out, no big deal. But when we're in AFib and these atria are just fibrillating, blood can get up into that appendage, stagnate, coagulate, form clot, 
And then if we um, rhythm convert these patients, that clot can embolize and, of, you know, of course, uh, to the brain and cause a stroke. So the incidence of AFib in just in general is about 25 uh, patients per 1,000 people will experience atrial fibrillation in their lifetime. So, um, so it's it's been nicknamed the stroke rhythm again because of the risk of stagnant blood flow and especially in that atrial um, appendage on the left. Uh, left side and embolization and clot formation um, to the head. Okay, so that's cardioversion. So think about questions you might have for that. Submit questions to Kim. Kim's going to come back and we'll answer as many questions as possible. Now, the last section we're going to go over is pretty, I've gone over this in quite a few different webinars. So it's going to be a repeat of what you've heard. But defibrillation. Um, so again, in, in VFib, Edison is the medicine. And we know a couple of concepts to be absolutely true in ventricular fibrillation. And the biggest is that shock as quickly as possible. If you have a witnessed ventricular fibrillation, you charge up that defibrillator and shock as quickly as possible. If it's unwitnessed, you would ideally do CPR first and then um, and then get the patient shocked. But for VFib, Edison is the medicine. Um, this is a paper I've um, I've actually in this webinar series. If you've been on other webinars, you've seen this before. But this is a classic paper that was published 13 years ago by Donna Edelson and Benabella Lance Becker when they were all at the University of Chicago. And what this demonstrated was that um, in for, specifically for VFib, if that pre-shock pause is less than 10 seconds and you're hitting at least a two-inch depth, you will see your greatest chance of shock success. So successfully shocking a patient out of ventricular fibrillation. And, um, and then we've actually, we've studied um, just the idea of using fixed versus escalating energy and higher energy levels. And probably one of the most classic studies is what was called the biphasic trial, um, demonstrating where um, they tried fixed energy just at 150 joules, they had much lower chances of shock success versus starting at 200 and escalating the energy up to 360 joules. So, you know, so there is some thought that higher energy levels used with biphasic defibrillators, um, which all of your, are your defibrillators on the market now are all biphasic, so that there's probably a, a higher chance of shock success um, when you use higher um, energy in ventricular fibrillation. And again, this is again just demonstrating the conversion rates when higher energy um, at 360 joules is used. So, um, you know, so there's some, I will just tell you, I've worked with some cardiologists who just say, you know, don't mess around with 200 joules, just go straight, th straight to 360. Um, there's some evidence that maybe just doing a 200, 300, 360 escalating um, would be uh, ideal. But, you know, this is so hard to study. And I'll say we have super limited data on this. Uh, but I would just say kind of know what your local protocols are at your hospital. But we, one thing we know is that pauses are really bad, especially if you're looking at shock success, that if there are multiple pauses um, when you're doing CPR, that that will decrease your chance of successfully getting a patient out of ventricular fibrillation. And so for every five second in duration of a pause, so for every five seconds that you pause, CPR, when um, shocking a patient who's in VFib, that decreases their chance of survival by 11%. So this is not a little deal. And so for any one, so imagine this, any one pause more than 20 seconds decreases your chance of getting a patient out of ventricular fibrillation. And so um, we know that, um, so for example, this is a case here, you can see, uh, this is the underlying rhythm, so clearly in VFib, uh, they're doing CPR, so this green is the impedance signal that's coming from your defib patch, it's showing they're doing CPR. Here, you can see where the line goes straight, they hold the CPR, they hold the CPR, so they held the CPR here for, I think this was like, oh, 37 seconds. They shocked here, so they delivered 360 joules, and you can see the shock was not successful. And when you've got these 
big pre-shock pauses that will decrease your chance of getting a patient out of ventricular fibrillation. So remember that study from the University of Chicago where they demonstrated shortening those pre-shock pauses and hitting at least a two-inch depth increases your chance of shock success. So this is um, just, a, I've shown this video before, so again, this is a repeat, but, um, but this is just kind of demonstrating um, well, okay, on my end, this isn't playing very fast. I don't know about your guys' end. I think maybe it's my internet signal. But doing CPR here, um, and what you're going to see is Julie's going to come off the chest. The patient's in V-fib, or the mannequin, I should say. This is a simulation here. But um, she's going to come off the chest. The mannequin is in V-fib, and we're going to be off the chest for a prolonged period of time. Oh, no, actually, that's the way it should be done. So, um, sorry, did I skip here? I think I got too ahead of myself. Oh, no, I don't know. Okay, I'm not sure, really sure what happened here. But um, but anyway, so, um, so I take that back. So what you saw here in the video is that Julie did CPR. Lori pre-charged the defibrillator. Julie stayed on the chest until the energy was ready to go. And then the next provider got up here, hovered over the chest and then got immediately back on the chest once uh, the shock was delivered. So how do you make this happen? So how do you decrease your time to defibrillation? I think one of the biggest things to do is have a team response. So basically, um, you know, have um, a team respond in codes where somebody's ultra, you know, you know um, educated on how to use the defibrillator. Um, you can't do something like that where you, um, you know, you pre-charge your defibrillator and have someone on the chest until the shock is ready to be delivered unless you've got a trust relationship there. And so, you know, you've got to be able to trust each other. And how do you do that? Well, if you have an organized team response where the same, you know, you've got just groups of people who respond and instead of just random and people responding to codes, that likely will increase your chance of shock success. And then having somebody who's used to using the defibrillator um, use it to, um, to you know, in codes, and they, they know how to pre-charge and how to, you know, get rid of the energy if it's not needed. So, so here's something you don't want to do. So this is a patient who's having a STEMI, and you can see their heart gets really irritable. Um, the patient goes into V-fib, so they're having a STEMI the cath lab got activated um, and what you can see here they got chest compression started so these big green waves they start chest compressions and then um, chest compressions are going here the patient gets shocked so they got shocked here was the shock successful? The answer is yes, there's an organized rhythm. And then what happened was the cardiologist asked that chest compressions get stopped. So they stopped chest compressions, you could see in the second line, and then the patient went back into V-fib. And that's exactly what you don't want to happen. So this is why you should stay on the chest. You know, when you're using Edison as your medicine, you've got to stay on the chest up until the point you shock. As soon as you shock, get back on that chest and keep going for two more minutes. Um, so you can see here, same patient, uh, the heart's really, uh, is still in V-fib. They shock. Now, was the shock successful? So look under here, do I see an organized rhythm? And the answer is yes. So the the um, shock was successful. However, this request was made for a second time to stop compressions and the patient went back into, you know, a shockable rhythm. So this is why you get on the chest and stay on the chest, um, you know, when you've got a patient in a shockable rhythm. So the one nice thing about using mechanical CPR, so this is where they're using the Lucas device, is you can actually have the Lucas going and shock right through it. So you can pause the Lucas, so you do, uh, just press the pause on the Lucas there, um, so this is mechanical CPR. Uh, you can pause chest compressions, quickly see what the rhythm is, restart the device, and you can shock right through it while chest compressions are being actively given. So that's actually a really nice feature of using mechanical CPR. Um, so uh, here's what you don't want to happen, though, if you're using mechanical CPR. So you can see um, mechanical CPR is going, stop the device for a prolonged period of time, they shock, you know, um, 
and it's just you don't you just don't want to do that right so you you should not need this is probably like 30 seconds or so you do not need 30 seconds to assess the rhythm you need like five seconds um you know assess the rhythm get the device going and then and shock right through uh, chest compressions with mechanical cpr um so what do you do if you've got a patient who's just in V-fib, you cannot get them out of it. One thing you should consider is changing the position of your pads. So if you're going anterior lateral, go anterior posterior. So change the direct, the um, pad placement and change the vector through which the energy is being delivered. And then of course, anytime you've got a patient who's in V-fib you can't get them out of, always ask, should this patient go to the cath lab? Okay, so um, that was kind of the skinny on um, using Edison as the medicine. Take home points, know your device, um, especially for pacing, cardioversion, and defibrillation. Pacing is the only time you need your ECG electrodes, you know, to um, uh, from your defibrillator device. Safety first, you're using electricity, so always make sure um, you're wearing gloves when um, touching the patient. Um, always make sure you clear when you're doing cardioversions or defibrillations. Um, you know, for pacing, do you have capture? Um, and then you should always be prepared preparing for uh, transvenous pacing. Cardioversion, is the patient stable or unstable? You know, if they're unstable, make sure you go through that safety checklist. Make sure your sync button is pressed. Make, you know, ideally make sure they've had sedation, uh, that their electrolytes have been replenished. And for defib, make sure you're doing compressions all the way up into the point that that shock gets delivered, and then immediately get back on the chest and provide chest compressions. So that is the skinny on using Edison as the medicine. So get your questions in. We'll try to answer as many questions. We've got 10 minutes here for questions. Um, so stay in touch. This is all um, how you can find me um, on social media. Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I do YouTube episodes, and actually today Today on Instagram and Facebook, I'll post a, a fun uh, about a four-minute video on cardioversion. So I did a, just a super quick synopsis on cardioversion. And then if you haven't, um, if you're into podcasts and you haven't um, uh, heard the Rhesus 10 podcast, this is a podcast I host. Um, uh, it's called Recess 10, and we talk about resuscitation topics in 10 minutes or less. I get to interview some of the most amazing re, um, resuscitation experts in the world, and um, it's available on Apple and Stitcher. It's kind of, again, it's called Recess 10. And then finally, um, we're, the next webinar on um, resuscitation kind of type topics is going to be um, October 9th. And what I'm going to talk about is what's new and exciting in resuscitation. So I have not ever done a webinar on this, and I'm going to be talking about cutting edge innovations like heads up CPR. Um, I'm going to be talking about drones to deliver AEDs and blood uh, to um, to the scene in the community. So we're going to actually be talking about some pretty cool stuff that um, you may or may not heard of that's happening nationally and internationally that's really, really innovative. So with that, I'm going to hand back over to Kim, where Kim is going to take some questions and tell you how to get your CEs. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a really great presentation. Before we start answering questions, I do want to remind people of a few things about continuing education. Uh, for nurses, respiratory therapists, and EMS professionals, this educational activity has been approved for one contact hour. You're going to want to go to saxtesting.com forward slash SL. You'll need to register on the site and complete the evaluation form. Upon successful submission, respiratory therapists and nurses will be able to print your certificate of completion, and for EMS professionals, you'll, your certificate of completion will be emailed to you. Support for this educational activity has been provided by Stryker. So we've had some really, oh, an archive version before we get started with questions. An archive and on-demand version will be available on savinglivesnow.org. An email will be sent to all registrants when it's available, and the on-demand version will be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. So, some really great questions have been asked across the board. I'm going to ask the most uh, prevalent question first, Nicole, and okay. it comes from multiple people. 
Okay. The first question, it really is talking about that initial pacing with asystole. Um, okay. AHA, ACLS, they don't recommend pacing with asystole. So people are kind of just looking for rationale on that. Uh, why do you recommend or why do you think pacing with asystole, even though it's not recommended by those organizations? Oh, it just doesn't work. I mean, that's the problem with pacing. If you've got a patient who's asystolic, they're likely at the cellular level very acidotic. And and that's one of the things, um, you know, like in a longer um, educational offering I would talk about is if you've got somebody, a patient who's really acidotic, they're going to be more resistant to um, uh, just effective pacing cardioversion or defibrillation. So uh, really in asystole, you need to get on the chest and do chest compressions and then figure out what the cause um, of the asystolic arrest is. Um, some asystole is V-fib deterioration. Um, other asystole can it can be a PEA that deteriorated. Um, it could be bradycardia that went into asystole. And really, you've just got to get on the chest and perfuse that patient. If you're wasting time with pacing, um, pacing first of all, you don't get good capture with with asystole. And then you've got a patient who's now who are there, now their brain and organs are not getting perfused because it's, you're messy, you're mucking around with pacing. So you need to just get on the chest and quickly figure out what the cause of it is. And just Agreed. in general, asystole outcomes are not good. Agreed. Rebecca has a question of, does end tidal CO2 monitoring during pacing contribute to energy use or rate setting with pacing? in addition to palpable pulses and or patient symptoms. Oh, so you're asking for like as just a, a monitoring modality. Yeah, I mean, so probably what you'll see, so probably, I'll just say probably, right? Uh, what you'll see, especially if the patient's in a low cardiac output state, is their end tidal CO2 will likely drop in a, in a low cardiac output state. So if that's the case, like if they've got VQ mismatch, um, in a low cardiac output state, meaning their end tidal CO2 is dropping, but their PaCO2 would be either staying the same or rising. That's what we call VQ mismatch. And um, in that case, like if you've got a low end tidal in a patient from VQ mismatch, likely it, their end tidal CO2 will improve um, as you improve perfusion. So that's a, actually a really good question. Yeah. Um, so, so the absolute, but you know, in general, you absolutely should use it as modality for any of these situations I just described. And um, yeah, so uh, maybe I should have put that in there, but this absolutely use end tidal CO2. Agreed. It's one, isn't it one of the only level one or le, or one A recommendations within yeah, resuscitation? It is. Yeah, it is for a verification of endotracheal tube placement. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Chrissy has a question. What is your standpoint on which is more important? current versus jewels delivered. Competing brands all have their studies on which is most effective. For example, if you have a defibrillator that will deliver a higher currency with less jewels, is that less effective than a device that will deliver more jewels and less current? Yeah, you know, there's there's very little literature out there on this. And I mean, every defibrillator company is going to, you know, kind of tout it their own way because they, they need to. I don't, you know, um, I don't know. I've worked with some electrophysiology experts that are considered world experts. And the our, they would not let us buy a defibrillator that did not deliver biphasic 360 joules. They were so convinced that you needed higher energy options. I mean, you know, so everyone's going to kind of twist it whatever way they want. There's very little evidence. Um, this is so difficult to study. Um, it's easier to study in animal models, but as we know, swine are not humans, <laughs> you know, so I don't, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's one of those things. I just, I worked with experts who really felt they needed higher energy options. Um, I don't think we have a, you know, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of different, different thoughts on that. Um, I personally would never buy a defibrillator that didn't give me the most options. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Just one or two more questions. One from Michaela. Can you discuss the EKG lead placement for transcutaneous pacing? They oh, had yeah, a discussion yeah. at work about it. Yeah, so basically you need your ECG, so your ECG leads, so think about each defibrillator has EC, ECG leads that 
you really the only time you need to use them is if you're um, going to pace and the way they act so it's usually either a three or five lead system and what you do is you put the leads on the patient in a regular configuration um, and those leads detect the underlying rhythm so that the patches know when to deliver the current so you have to have the ECG leads on anytime you pace. Great hopefully that question. answered the question. Yeah, no, I, hopefully that answered it. It's, it's as simple as that. Your ECG leads act as the, the eyes of your underlying rhythm. Great question. One last question. It's coming from Laura. You mentioned that a patient who is acidotic may change the treatment. Do you recommend an ABG prior to pacing or defibrillation? Um, no, I would never. So let me just say, absolutely not. I would never delay therapy for it. Is it a nice to have? Sure. Um, you know, and if it's if, if they're really acidotic, let's say a pH, I'll just make up some numbers like a pH of seven or seven point one. Um, if defibrillation is not working, I'm going to amp up the energy. Like I'm absolutely going to amp up the energy in that case. Um, so you're, you're likely going to need more energy to get successful pacing, cardioversion, or defibrillation. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Well, we I just wanted to, yeah, just really quick, I'll just say thanks to everyone for coming and joining. Um, you know, I, I hope you got a couple things or two out of this. So with Kim, take it away and Lisa will wrap up this webinar. Great. Thank you so much. I am going to hand it over to Tracy for the last minute instructions. Excellent. We'd like to thank uh, both of our speakers today, Nicole and Kimberly, and all those that attended today's webinar. The survey, immediately upon the conclusion of our webinar today, you will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate any feedback. For your CE certificate of completion, in one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions and the link to attain your CE credits, which is at saxtexting.com slash sl. And on behalf of Sex Healthcare Communications and our presenters today, thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your day.